May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A city seated on the mountain cannot be healed. You must be the light of the world. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, yesterday we had the flames of the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. Today we have the Midas and the golden touch of a great doctor of the church, St. John Chrysostom. He was called John of Antioch, born in 3. 47 AD, Patriarch of Constantinople, was Midas in the pulpit. We know this not only from his homilies, of which hundreds have been preserved, but even from the nickname he earned, Chrysostom, which means the golden tongued. For him, the power in scripture was a power to transform. The minute particulars of everyday work, family, and society. The method he learned at Antioch, remember Antioch is a place where Christians was first named, for searching out the historical, the concrete historical situations in Jesus' life. He used equally well in analyzing the concrete circumstances of his congregations. The magnificent homilies of this great saint today hit home their mark. They spoke of the marketplace, the marriage bed, the sports arena of cooking, investments and cosmetics. And they were practical. Remember, St. Francis tells the Franciscans to be short and brief in their homilies to speak about vices and virtues, pain and glory. This is the guise of the great saint today. Practical homilies, understandable and to the point. He not only described what he saw, but he also prescribed a moral and aesthetical course of action. Yet preaching was perhaps the last thing that this great saint and doctor of the church wanted to do. The only son of a pious widow, John studied law and rhetoric in Antioch. Yet early on, he was in fact attracted by the contemplative life. His mother begged him not to make her a widow again after her husband had died by fleeing to the desert. For a time, he respected her wishes by living as much as possible at home in a life of silence and fasting. But in the year 374, he clearly discerned the call to live life in solitude. He retired first as a monk and then as a hermit. But the years of fasting and sleeplessness proved the limits of his bodily endurance. Thus he suffered ill health. He returned to Antioch, where he was ordained deacon in the year 381 and ordained to the priesthood in the year 386. In the city, John won renown for his preaching and soon found himself assigned to the most prestigious pulpit. His fame spread far beyond Syria. In the year 398, he received word that he'd been named Patriarch of Constantinople. He tried in vain to refuse this position. But the emperor sent for him with an armed escort. John, in this respect, could not refuse. So he found himself in this imperial city. He found a demoralized clergy. Many living in sin, in fornication and drunkenness. John set about the reform of the clergy, renewing the enforcement of priestly disciplines and defrocking priests who proved unrepentant. His course of re renewal pleased many in Constantinople who had been disgusted by the state of the church, but earned him, as we know, many enemies. The foe who mattered most, his greatest enemy then, an enemy became the Empress Eudoxia, whom John had specially targeted in his masterful homilies on vanity. 
John also discovers an enemy in the influential Archbishop of Alexandria, Theophilus, who roused, in fact, other bishops to band together and have John deposed and exiled. Theophilus' maneuverings worked. John was sent away in the year 403, but the people of Constantinople revolted. And so the Empress herself had him recalled to his see. But shortly after returning, there was a great games organized in Constantinople, and there was even a great silver statue erected of the Empress outside, directly outside the main church in Constantinople. What did John do? Without fear, he spoke about the vanity of Eudoxia. Thus, he was exiled again. Exiled, he appealed to the Pope who supported him, but was unable to prevail upon the Emperor. In Armenia, St. John, where he was exiled now, continued to win fame for his preaching and counsel, further infuriating his enemies. They asked him, the Emperor, to banish him even further far afield into the Black Sea. On his way there, John was forced to march long distances in driving rain and oppressive heat. Never in good health he was at the age of 60, little able to withstand this torture. Thus, he died en route in the year 407. This is the great doctor of the church we celebrate today. What can we learn then from this great soldier of Christ, this great soldier who spoke many beautiful things about the Blessed Virgin Mary. Must we not speak the truth with clarity and charity? In and out of season as ministers of the church, Jesus Christ. We know this expression, this maxim, the truth hurts. The truth hurts. Look at the example today of the golden mouth of St. John Chrysostom in the mold of St. Athanasius and St. John Fisher, who were in minority but spoke the truth. Great saint today was not afraid to speak the message of the gospel and condemn the perversion and immorality of his age. Raise up Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary, new prelates of our age, to speak Again, this Midas touch without fear. We thank the Lord for the tiny number of prelates beating the constant drumbeat of the truth today. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, Bishop Strickland of Texas. Raise up more prelates of great virtue to speak with clarity and charity without confusion on these moral evils threatening to destroy the fabric of the human family today. Pornography, contraception, same-sex unions, euthanasia, gender ideology. The use of fetal tissue from our aborted brothers and sisters in the pursuit of science and medicines, etc., etc. The list is endless, not to mention also the abuses in the Catholic Church itself, the tragic loss of faith, the confused doctrine never ever witnessed as now, never ever witnessed before, as such as now. And what about the greatest moral evil of our times? Not just the moral evil of our times, but the moral evil of all times, the A word, abortion. The tragedy of our times, we have 10 million reasons why to say this word. Why 10 million? Because shortly, in a few months' time, this is a number of babies that have been taken from the wounds, killed in this country, in the UK. This is the tragedy of our times. This is why we have all of these chastisements. This is a word which is very rarely spoken about even from the pulpit. What would St. John Chrysostom do nowadays? 
about this tragedy. Would he speak about it? Yes or no? Many, even in the clergy, think it is inappropriate, inappropriate to speak about this word. Why? Because there is many even in the congregation who are suffering this tragedy. So better not to speak about it. Is this right? Yes or no? We we'll give an example. Give a story last week speaking to a man who had a conversion. He was the one of the directors of Mary Stopes in the UK. This is the main abortion provider in these aisles, even exported internationally. He was in fact the director of international affairs under his guise, umbrella. He managed more than 50 centers of execution around the world. He was part of a Pentecostal congregation in the UK. He said nobody ever spoke about this topic. Never in his experience. One day he was sat in the pews, had a cup of coffee with his friends afterwards, and they were asking each other what they did for a living. He said he was a director of Mary Stopes. The two other men looked at each other in silence and then walked off. He knew there was something wrong. This was the first illumination to know what he was doing. There was something wrong. He said what would have happened if this truth had been spoken from the pulpit. He had no idea of the moral evil he was involved in. Why did nobody speak about it? This is the dilemma and this is why we have to speak the truth about these things, move out of our comfort zone, but to speak with clarity in charity like the saint of today, to speak with the power of the Holy Spirit like Our Lady. Remember, the laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. We ask Our Lady, remember she was the great exponent of silence when not and when to speak. Our Lady speaking six or seven times in the gospel, especially remember the powerful words at Cana at Galilee, not only to start the first miracle of Jesus Christ, but to start his ministry. We ask Our Lady then the grace today to speak with this charity, but this clarity. We ask the Queen of Charity, who spoke so well at Cana for the gift of her ardent charity in preaching for all prelates, not to blow their own trumpets, so to speak, but to live holy lives, holy lives in pursuit of virtue, to walk the path of Christian perfection, to preach with this ardent charity to convict souls through the power of the Holy Spirit, to bring them to true sorrow, repentance, and the salvation of their souls, so that one day we will gaze on the golden face of Jesus Christ, our Savior in eternity. Amen. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.